Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Strange Radios. My name is Jeremy, and I am back with my vinyl collection part two, covering metal in this episode. Now, for those of you who missed the first one, which is basically everybody, <laughs> um, the first episode was my rap albums. Um, my album collection in general is pretty meager, pretty short, pretty small. Um, but while it, it does, while I don't have a lot of records, I don't have many records. I do have the ones I do have are interesting. I think, obviously, I own them. So yeah, uh, like I said, this episode is going to be metal. The metal albums I have, I have eight. Again, meager collection, but you will see some things in here I think that will interest you, hopefully. That's the entire point of this. First White Russian of the year. This is my drink of the summer. Uh, didn't mix this one well enough, I don't think. But, you know, we'll work on that as the summer goes along. Anyways, first up, we're going alphabetically. This is Birdsum, Bayless, with uh, Gatefold, double album. Uh, not going to bother pulling any of these records out. They're all just on black vinyl, so it's irrelevant. But, um, yeah, this was back in 2010 is the date on this. It was Varg's first album after his release from prison. So it was about some first metal album in like a decade and a half or so. Um, this album gets mixed reviews I've seen online. And I guess I understand why. Their follow-up to this, or their Varg's follow-up to this, um, Fallen, I think is a better album. But I still think Bayless um, still has some great moments on it. Just in terms of being like a straightforward, lo-fi, burtsome style black metal album. I'll dig it. Is it his best work? No. But it's still really cool. That's kind of black metal I like. Next album is Sirith Ungle with their debut album, Frost and Fire. Sirith Ungle was, well, first of all, they're named after J.R.R. Tolkien, which, you know, I'll forgive them for that. Um, they're a California metal band from the late 70s, I think, is when their inception was. Um, this album is their debut, like I said, 1980. Um, first of all, you'll notice the album cover artwork there by Michael uh, Whelan, I want to say, W-H-E-L-A-N. Fantastic artist who's done a lot of fantasy artworks. And a lot of, uh, <laughs> incidentally, a lot of metal artwork as well. Um... That's what drew me to this album, was the artwork. It looks gorgeous. And yeah, Sirith Ungle, a heavy metal band, definitely started as more of a traditional heavy metal act. Um, even though it was 1980, they weren't really in that thrash lane. They are more just a hard rock heavy metal band. You can see here, the band photo on the back is kind of illustrating that point. And so this is more just a straight up hard rock album, but... For hard rock in 1980, it's still pretty, still pretty good. Uh, this band, as they would progress, would later incorporate uh, the sort of growing power metal movement of the time. They start incorporating those sounds, and they even started incorporating early, early like a doom metal influence uh, into their records. Not so much on the debut though. Like I said, this is just a straightforward hard rock album, and it's still pretty good. However, on their third album 1986 is one foot in hell uh, the doom metal influences definitely are creeping in here with the slower tempos and the just crushing riffs um, yeah again the artwork that artwork oh my god 1986 is one foot in hell by Sirith Ungol artwork on these records are beautiful uh, this record, I will admit the vocals on it for me are kind of, I don't know, some days I really dig them, and some days I really don't. I just have to be in the mood for it. That might sound weird, but I think you kind of get what I mean. Um, they're just really shrill and like just energetic and high-pitched and just sort of over the top, but 
when I'm in the mood for it, it does work really well. And like I said, when the when this album gets slower, gets those doomy elements going, that's when it's at its high points. Um, Sirith Ungol has four records, and I have two of them. I really want to get the other two, because I'm kind of a completist. Next up, we have an, a Canadian metal band called Electro Quarterstaff. And this is their debut album called Gretzky, named after Wayne Gretzky because like, because they're Canadian. Uh, this is their debut album, um, Gatefold, double album. And again, that artwork is really, really good. Oh, there's the inside of it. So Electro Quarterstaff are sort of a technical progressive metal band. Um, instrumental. They don't have a vocalist. Uh, on this album, their debut, they have three guitarists and a drummer, and that's it. And the one thing... Oh, excuse me. The one thing that really stands out here, in terms of the artwork and the song titles, is and the album title, I guess, Gretzky, is the band's humor. Um, songs like Twisted Squid... The Right to Arm Bears, Eye Patch Romance, and the final song, Something's Awry in the Het Field of Dreams. Yeah, uh, to reiterate, progressive, um, thrashy. There's moments on here where it gets really frenetic and kind of reminds me of um, Dillinger Escape Plan, in part. Not a lot, just a few moments here and there. Um, actually, if I had, you know, another think about it. They kind of remind me of a thrashier protest the hero, except without vocals in some parts. They're really technical, they're really adventurous, and they have a lot of uh, interesting musical ideas over this uh, double album debut. Following that up, their second album, this is Electric Quarterstaff with Ackroyd, named after Dan Ackroyd, because, again, they're Canadian. But this is I think my favorite album cover of all time I won't even talk about the music that much um okay let's talk about the music briefly uh, they still have the three guitarists they still have the drummer no vocalist but they do have a bass player now which actually does flesh out the sound of this band quite a bit um it really I don't know it just gives it that fuller fuller sound uh, this is not a double album this is just a single record but the album artwork oh my god anthropomorphized sort of uh, culture and almost a deification of Southern American culture, ancient culture, Mayan, Aztec, what have you. And on the other side here, the anthropomorphism or deification of the Inuit culture of the far north. You see the uh, whalebone blade they have, he has behind his back and the uh, curved blade, I do believe. A bit of a curve to it behind his back, and the peace pipes and the uh, decapitated heads and the uh, wooden boats and the walruses and fishing and oh, you know, it's just a gorgeous looking album. And on the back, you have narwhals and the, that cool smoke uh, from the peace pipes on the front, sort of billowing over across the whole thing. And my favorite part of the whole artwork, and it, admittedly, you know, I'm. It took me longer to realize this than it should have, but on the back here you have a great amalgamation of these two uh, sort of cultures of a South American ancient temple pyramid uh, turned into a fishing tackle box that uh, someone who is Inuit living in the far north might use. Anyways, um, yeah, so again, just more progressive thrashy, technical, metal, instrumental. Uh, the humor is still here in the song titles, like McNutty, Waltz of the Swedish Meatballs, Unholy Gravy, Stroganov, Japanese Upside Down Cake. A lot of food theme on this one. It's like a weird owl or something. Anyways, it's a great record. Um, if anything, it's just a beautiful looking record, but the music on it is actually quite good as well. 
um, better than their debut, I would say, because the bass actually, like I said, it fleshes out the sound quite a bit and really sort of brings some cohesion that was perhaps needed. Next up, booze. And then, um, oh, this is Judas Priest, Sin After Sin, the third album from 1977. Um, it's got a few, it's got a few good tracks. Um, everyone knows this record though. Um, I'm not even gonna lie. My my favorites are the big ones off this record: Dissident Aggressor and Diamonds and Rust. Their cover of that Joan Baez song. Those are really the only two that I revisit on this album. Um, the opener, Sinner, is not bad, but the rest of it, mm, you know, the, Judas Priest. They're fine. They're fine. Uh, except for their latest album, Firepower, which is surprisingly amazing. <laughs> how do you... Yeah. Like, how do you go 40 years into your career and then drop the best thing you've ever done? It's mind-blowing in a way. Anyways, next up, we have the self-titled debut and the only album from Sea Hags, a Californian... Uh, hair metal band, as you could probably tell from the band photo there. Uh, randomly found this in a used record shop, was drawn to it by the cover, because it does look cool. Um, and I looked at the back of it, and I saw the band photo, and I assumed it was hair metal, which it is. And hair metal, I just, I can't get on board with. It just drives me up the wall, just... I don't know what it is sonically, just the drivel in the lyrics, like it just, it just annoys me. But there are two bands that for some reason don't bother me. One of them is Sea Hags, which I didn't know at the time, and the other one is Skid Row, surprisingly enough. Skid Row doesn't really bother me that much. Anyways, so I'm looking at the back of the album cover in the store. You know, I'm reading the song titles, Half the Way Valley, Doghouse, Too Much T-Bone, Back to the Grind, Into the Mood for Love, I'm sorry, In the Mood for Love. Yeah, it's hair metal, I'm like, oh god. Like, it was such a cool cover, but then, that. And on the back they have their list of uh, thank yous and whatnot. Just on the first sentence, or not the first sentence, the first line, the first line here. The Sea Hags wish to thank the following. Greg Langston, John Carter, Kirk Hammett and Metallica. Okay, you have me interested now. Um, that really piqued my interest. And so I bought it. And didn't find out about the band until uh, when I started listening to this record and researching it online. That, uh, yeah, they're a hair metal band. Kind of an with an edge, a harder edge to them than most. And Kirk Hammett, for whatever reason, was a champion of them. He quite enjoyed this group, and he helped produce um, a demo for them, as well as Sylvia Massey, I think, produced a demo for these guys. And long story short, because they, they had a short history as a band, I think from like 87 to 91 was their entire existence. But Man, it's chock full of just shit music industry stories. Just terrible management. Um, both during this record and after. Um, band changes, like lineup changes constantly before this record, during the recording of this debut album, and after this record, just band members changing. Uh, they went on a European tour for this record, and I then broke up while they were on tour in Europe. And there was talk about them reconvening or, you know, starting the band up again. But the bass player and one of the founding members uh, contracted pneumonia and sadly passed away in 1991. And so the other members were just like, okay, we're done. I don't know if they ever reconvened after that. They may have had a short trial at a reunion like years years later but this was the only record they ever did and like i said for hair metal surprisingly tolerable 
Uh, it's got a harder edge than most hair metal bands of the 80s. This is late 80s. This one was 1989. And the album cover is what drew me in. Cool looking album. Um, the last album here is a, another Canadian metal band, Untimely Demise, with their debut album, City of Steel. This is from 2010. This is on War on Music as well. I don't know if that's the original label, but they printed it in 2010. Um, oh, sorry, they printed it in 2012. It came out in 2010. Um, yeah, Untimely Demise, modern thrash metal band from Saskatchewan, I want to say. Um, you'll see on the back here, ignore the band photo because it doesn't really encapsulate their sound, but down here in the corner, produced by Glenn Drover, who um, actually did some guitar work on this album as well. Who you may reckon, or remember from, well, he had stints in Megadeth and King Diamond and others. He's had a few projects on the go. He has his own, oh God, he has his own solo, not solo album, but his own band that I don't recall that I'm going to post, that I'm going to include here, but check that out as well. But yeah, uh, Untimely Demise. Modern thrash that t takes heavily from 80s, <laughs> that takes, borrows heavily from 80s thrash metal, uh, particularly Megadeth, which, you know, Glenn Drover producing it kind of makes sense in that regard. Um, yeah, just upbeat, thrashy fucking stuff. Uh, the vocals even kind of reminiscent of Dave from Megadeth. You know, not I think, not that I'm considering it, uh, this band kind of reminds me of, if you took Megadeth and cross them with Death. Because it is thrashy, sort of throwback to the 80s, but it's definitely harder than Megadeth ever was. It's got quite a bit more heavy edge to it. And again, the album cover is pretty dope, except for this foot here, which is so poorly photoshopped into place. Untimely Demise, that is the last metal album of my list. So... I hope I, I'm hoping to remember to leave links this time to everything I spoke about. Uh, hopefully, you guys know those records and dig those records. If you don't, uh, feel free to tell me I'm an idiot. That'd be cool. If you do like those bands, awesome. Tell me what you think about those particular albums. Um, or if, uh, you think I'd be into something else based on those. Again, uh, my vinyl collection is. Is, is small compared to my CD collection um, by, by a considerable margin. But that is the entirety of my metal records. No, it is not. I just remembered. I'm not going to go grab it. It's in the other room. But I have a flexi disc of um, a single by Arch Enemy. It came in a magazine of some sort. Some metal magazine. I don't remember which one. It's all right. I don't even know why I brought it up. <laughs> it's completely irrelevant. So that's gonna that's gonna be it. Um, thanks for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Please leave your comments down below. And this has been Strange Radios. Stranger, adios.